How does computer memory and level design affect each other? In more ways than you'd imagine. The original NES had 2 kilobytes of RAM, but more could be available in the game's cartridge if necessary. In the NES, a game would store data in the console's RAM, which would then be read and transformed into an image displayed on screen. By selectively storing the right pieces of data, one could draw the level's content for the user to see. In memory, there'd be a value called an offset that would indicate the camera's location within that memory. Increase the offset by one, and the camera would move one pixel to the right. Decrease it, and the camera would move to the left. This reduced the level of processing required to create the illusion of scrolling in a level, since all a game needed to do was copy content into RAM and adjust the offset accordingly. So how does RAM and offsets affect level design? When the first NES games came out, they could do this offset trick, but for only one axis. This means game could only scroll horizontally or vertically, but not both at the same time. Game designers then created numerous techniques to mask this limitation. In Mega Man, when reaching the end of a section, there would always be a set of letters. The designers placed the letters in a way to hide the fact that the memory's layout just went from horizontal to vertical. Metroid would employ a similar technique where the doors changed the design pace as well, enabling designers to alternate between fully vertical and horizontal levels. What's ironic is that these layouts become so iconic for these franchises that their modern versions still maintain them. Mega Man 10, released in 2010, employed the letter design, even though the consoles it ran on were thousands of times faster than the NES. The first game to break this mode was Mario 3, since it could have simultaneous horizontal and vertical scrolling. It achieved this via special processing power that came with the game's cartridge. However, the game still faced another type of memory limitation, called pallet space. Consoles such as the NES present a color on screen via level of indirection. The video RAM wouldn't actually contain the color of what was actually going to be presented on screen. Instead, it contained what's known as a palette index for each pixel to draw. Think of the palette index as a number the NES used to look up which color to display. So in this example, 1 means red, 2 means blue, and 3 means yellow. The palette then is what's used to convert the numbers into colors. It's a bit complicated to explain why this was done, but in short, it saved a lot of memory, which was scarce and expensive in consoles such as the NES. For comparison, the original Mario game occupied 32 kilobytes of space. Meanwhile, this picture of Mario occupies 221 kilobytes. So although Mario 3 could scroll freely, it still had to do with palettes. The limitation is that only a finite set of colors can fit inside the NES palette, which was usually about 55. Whenever the game wished to display a richer set of colors, that is, the colors that were currently not residing in the palette, it had to swap the contents of the palettes out. But how did it do that? You notice that in several sections of Mario 3, the player goes through a pipe, the screen fades, and once we're back, we're in a completely new environment. What the designers figured out was which enemies, content, and level colors belonged to which palettes and adjusted their layouts accordingly. The pipes acted both as a means to circumvent the NES technical limitation, as well as to imprint an experience of progression into the user. Not only that, some games use the palette swap while the game is still rendering content. Remember how flashy the screen got when you died in Ninja Gaiden? The game is swapping the palette back and forth for the whole screen, creating that effect. This technique was heavily used in numerous games, and it's called palette animation. Well, how about consoles like the PlayStation? How did designers circumvent the limitation of disk-based games? CDs allowed a giant leap on quantity of memory available for games to use, but at a cost. Reading this content was inherently slow because games had to read from the CD and then store that data into RAM. Since this process sometimes took seconds to perform, games now had to deal with load screens. One example of how games addressed that was with Resident Evil. Whenever the player switched rooms, a door would appear over a black screen. An animation would ensue, and then the player would see the new room. Guess what? While the animation of the door opening was ongoing, the game was loading the content from disk for the next room. The door is merely a disguise with the load screen. 
The black background isn't just aesthetics either. Since it's a uniform color, developers could use this fact to perform various optimization tricks to save memory space behind the scenes. Again, this design element became so famous that modern re-releases of Resident Evil still employ them. As technology evolved, a new technology was developed called Asynchronous File I.O., also known as streaming. This allowed games to move content in and out of RAM while the game was still ongoing, creating the illusion that the game had loaded more content than it actually did. This meant users didn't see a loading screen if the game was cleverly designed and programmed. God of War did this trick by adding various sections in the game which the player had to literally traverse. As the player progressed, the game got rid of the contents from the previous section and loaded new. This meant level designers had to create level loading areas to embrace this technique. Also, throughout the game, sometimes doors would shut behind the character to halt them from traveling back. That's because the game got rid of a section altogether in RAM, and thus the designers used a simple trick to address the limitation. It's not that they just didn't want the user to traverse back, it's that the content no longer existed altogether in RAM. Nowadays, games such as Skyrim and GTA stream entire worlds as the player traverses them, without the need of using load screens. I hope you enjoyed this video, so let me know your thoughts on this analysis in the comments down below. Feel free to suggest a topic or game as well that you'd like to see analyzed. Lastly, click on the green subscribe button of power to sign up for more content. Thanks for watching, until then, cheers!